Today we will review which nutrients are important for healthy bone marrow functioning and look at how to integrate foods rich in these nutrients into your daily diet. We will also look at some barriers to eating well. Of course, there are many overpromises or outright scams around, and we will look at some of these too, and I will give you some tips for how to recognize them. Most of us know we should eat a balanced and varied diet, but that isn't always easy to do, especially when we're under stress or feeling fatigued. Many of us find ourselves grabbing food on the go, which may have more sugar and salt or be more processed than if eaten fresh. This type of food may taste good, but isn't very satisfying often, so we may eat more of it than we need or intend to. And you know, it's quite possible to be overfed and undernourished. A simple rule of thumb is to have a majority of your food come from the plant world. And with the lunch we just had, I think you all noticed how it was so colorful, so attractive, and appealing, and actually really an exceptional. For a hotel, I thought it was really one of the very, very good. So you are here today. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back for a second. Um, I just wanted to mention about the, 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 what is in the plant world. And here's one. Of, the word plant is one of those words that I say. <laughs> you say plant, plant. <laughs> um, anyway, what I really mean are things that come from the world where nothing came from something that had an eye or moved around. Plants themselves, <laughs> they're in the ground. Um, so it's beans, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and your protein would come from fish, poultry, eggs, and lean meat. But some people want to be vegetarian, in which case it's perfectly um, possible to get very good protein from a vegetarian source. Often vegetarians will get it from eggs or from dairy products. But you can also have a vegan diet. I saw one of the dishes out there was vegan. In this situation, your protein would come from either combining beans or other legumes with um, including peas or soy products, like tofu or soy milk, with a grain, and a grain such as whole wheat, brown rice, or other cereals. And then a vegan diet can also provide sufficient pro protein that is um, balanced. So you're here today because either you or a loved one has received a diagnosis of a bone marrow condition and would like to know if there are some foods that may help you to con combat this and improve your overall health. One of the ways to look at this is to focus on healthy cell functioning, or how DNA, which is like the recipe for each cell, may be protected. I call this the three A's. And we talk about these again in a little while. Let me just go back here for a second there. Um, think of antioxidants, and I'm going to go over this several times during this talk. But antioxidants, has it, who's heard of an antioxidant here? Okay, pretty much everybody. When I used to give talks many years ago at the wellness community, I would ask that question and nobody had heard of it. And then I used to get a little demonstration where I would get a green apple, cut it in half, and put it out in the air, and, you know, it goes brown, right? And then I would get some lemon juice and put the lemon juice on the apple, and that one that had the lemon juice would not go brown because it had the antioxidants. So basically, it's protecting from uh, oxidative, which may be damaging. Um, so antioxidants protect DNA integrity. Anti-inflammatories prevent cells from dividing faster than normal and thus being at risk for making a mistake. And the third A, or anti-carcinogens, clean up any mistakes that may have been made and prevent them from persisting. The good news is that these crucial factors are found in most of the vegetables, fruits, spices, and culinary herbs that make good food taste good. Fiber is another important component of food that comes from the plant world. This is the structural part of the plants, like the stalks or the, or the outside of the beans or outside of the grains. And although we don't actually digest that, which is why it's called fiber, it provides a home for the bacteria and microbes that live in our intestinal tract and actually also helps um, to balance our uptake of sugar. 
And this is sometimes called glycemic load, and we will look at that in more detail in a moment too. So now let me come to this quote. Hippocrates is considered the father of nutritional medicine. Oh, what happened to the... Oh, here we are. <laughs> and um, on the bottom right, you'll see a little slide of watercress. Now, watercress is thought to have been the medicine he talks about when he says, let medicine be your food and food be your medicine. His hospital was on a river, and in the center of the river was an island, and the island had all this watercress on it. And watercress is actually part of the cruciferous family, which is the cabbage family, um, and it's really a wonderful thing to add to sandwiches, salads. You can make a soup. It's a, it's a delicious and very healthful vegetable. But his quote is really important. As to diseases, make a habit of two things, to help or at least do no harm. And the reason it's important is because I don't know if many of you have had this happen, but many of the patients I work with, they have friends and family who want to help. They really want to be doing something. And they'll say, oh, you must take this supplement, or you must do this, or maybe you have to go to some special juicing um, protocol. And in many cases, it just some, may just doesn't feel quite right to you, or maybe the person who's telling you is telling it in a very persuasive voice, but at the end of the day, they're making money out of it. So go with your gut. Um, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And there are some good websites where you can actually check things out. The government, um, our taxpayer dollar, has a very good one um, called the nccam.nih. Gov, which is the National Institute um, for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And then the other website to check would be the FDA. And the FDA has a consumer health fraud uh, section. And they keep it very up to date with what's going on. And the third website that you can look at is mostly helpful. Sometimes it's a little over the top about it. But is quite helpful called Quack Watch. And that's like quack, duck, <laughs> um, and quackwatch.org. And they also do um, surveil and make sure that uh, if, so, if a program is, is offering too much, they'll tell you. Yes? Could you repeat the very first one? Yes. The first one is N, as in no one, C-C-A-M, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, dot N-I-H, Dot gov, G -O -V. So those three sites, if you, you know, if somebody's putting a lot of pressure on you to buy Kangen water, let's say, you can go to those sites and look at them, and I'm sure, I mean, I haven't double-checked on that one, but I'm pretty sure you'll find something on one of those three. And then, you know, you can just say, well, thank you very much for offering um, but right now, I, I think I'm going to, to wait or, you know, my nutritionist, you can blame me, says that. Says it. <laughs> but um, at least you'll have somewhere to go and, and check out things. Okay. So what nutrients does your bone marrow need? Good quality protein. On the right-hand side there, you'll see I'm listing the nutrients that are really necessary. Good quality protein is very important. This provides all of the amino acids or building blocks to form new cells. We also need essential fatty acids that come from oils like olive or grapeseed oil. In addition, we need certain vitamins and minerals, especially B-complex, E, K, iron, and zinc. And immunity is another aspect of healthy bone marrow functioning. Whether we are making white blood cells, also called leukocytes, or circulating cells called lymphocytes, which include natural killer cells, we still need similar nutrients. Protein, central fatty acids, key B vitamins like folate, vitamin, uh, riboflavin, vitamin B2 and B12, and minerals like zinc, magnesium, and boron. Lecithin is an old-fashioned health food that provides important fat-like substances called phospholipids that allow for communication between different cell types. Lecithin is also found in certain foods as an emulsifier, such as peanut and other nut butters, ice cream, or mayonnaise. 
Yes, ice cream. <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> so let's look at some of these important nutrients in turn, starting with protein, which comes from the Greek for life. If we don't have enough protein in the diet, our bodies will rob our own muscle to get the needed building blocks for making red and white cells. Serum, albumin, and globulin are circulating proteins that may be measured by your doctor to ensure that you have enough protein in your system. Good food sources of protein include eggs, lean meat, and fish, as noted earlier. When you need a little additional protein, perhaps because of fever, infection, or because of chemotherapy, then an easy way to do this is to include a smoothie. And you can also have one to two tablespoons of perhaps an unflavored whey protein, if you don't want the, whey, the flavor, which dissolves very easily. Greek yogurt is a newer product that's a dairy product that has similar protein content to string cheese, um, has a slightly creamier texture, and has a live um, culture still in it. And nut butters are another good energy-dense source of protein, such as almond, walnut, or hazelnut butters. Tofu or curd cheese make great additions to any vegetable dish, such as spinach or kale, and increase the protein of your diet in an effortless way. So essential fatty acids are found in oils and fats, and most of us do get sufficient of these, However, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, omega is the Greek word for end, and the double bond that comes from the end, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the 3, the omega-3, we need to get that in our diet. And in general, what's happened in the last 100 years or so is that we're actually eating much more of the omega-6 and much less of the omega-3. That's really since the industrialization of our diet more. And... Um, what we need to do then is to add more omega-3s back, and those come from pine nuts, flax, chia seeds, all of which are rich in omega-3s. And you may also wish to add barrage or blackcurrant seed oil, which are excellent sources of a fatty acid called GLA, which is often helpful for women um, who have PMS, and sometimes it helps with some hormonal balances. This is a chart that I've kind of put together over the years. I know it's a little bit busy, but if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see the omega-3s. And in humans, we elongate from ALA, the top one on the right, to the next one down, EPA, in a fairly complex set of enzymes. Um, there's about four different reactions that happen there. Some people do that really well, in which case they can be a vegan and feel great. But some people don't do it very well, and you don't really know until you try. But the people who become a vegan and don't feel good, it's probably because they don't do that very well. And those are the people who benefit mostly um, from having fish or fish oil. And nowadays, there's actually an omega-3 that's made by algae. So in, it's actually a vegetarian source of um, omega-3. So when you see some of the milk that has omega-3 on the top, that's from an algae source. So that's allowing us to add more omega-3 into the diet. But the more you have meats, especially processed red meats, that are possibly pro-inflammatory because of the way we're feeding the animals, we're feeding them corn, we're feeding them a diet that's not their natural diet. If they're eating grass, then they would have a lot of the ALA or 18-3. But because we're feeding them corn, they don't. So a lot of them have more of that pro, the one in red, and the more of that you eat, the more you have to balance it with the one on the right. So it's, as I say, I'm so, I know it's a complicated slide, but I think it's important because it helps us to understand why we're focusing more on omega-3 today than we were in the past. So what I'm going to do now is kind of go through each of the nutrients we were talking about as key building blocks and I recommend, you know, you maybe just pick out one or two foods that you like, that you know you should be getting on a regular basis. Um, it doesn't mean you have to eat every single one of those things every day. <laughs> um, so let's look. The B, vitamin B complex is a group of individual nutrients, some of which ha have numbers and some just names. 
For example, vitamin B12, which is important for red blood cell formation, and folate, or folic acid, which is also important in the formation of blood cells. The B vitamins are usually found together in healthy diets that have sufficient protein, whole grains, beans, nuts, and vegetables. Wheat flour is fortified with B vitamins, including folate, as the milling or removal of the bran and the wheat germ also removes some of the nutritional value of the flour. Fortification then replaces these lost vitamins, or if you select the whole grain, then these nutrients are already, already present. So breakfast cereals, breads, and crackers made from fortified flour provide sufficient B vitamins so that most Americans are not deficient unless they consume alcohol, which destroys folic acid. And this is very important because many people, that's one of the reasons that they fortified grain with folate because folic acid is so important around the time of conception. And since most pregnancies are not planned, if somebody is drinking when they conceive and they don't have enough folate, they're at a higher risk for um, the DNA not to be accurately replicated. Um, and, of course, needs are increased if, uh, in the case of infections or during pregnancy. And one other thing I'd like to say is in, just in case, and we'll talk about iron in a minute, but there are some people, because of multiple transfusions, you have to be careful with the amount of iron in your diet. And many of these fortified cereals actually have quite a lot of iron in them. So you may want to not have a fortified cereal um, if that's what you're watching for. So vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin with antioxidant properties that is very important in regulating thrombosis. Now, large doses of vitamin E may thin the blood, so we should be cautious in taking supplements above the typical RDA amount, as they may interact with aspirin or other anti-clotting agents and cause excessive bleeding. Good food sources of vitamin E include wheat germ, as I just mentioned, nuts and seeds of all types, and especially the oils where vitamin E is sometimes added as a preservative or as an antioxidant. Vitamin K is another fat-soluble vitamin, and this means that like vitamin E, it's stored in your liver, and unlike the B vitamins and C, which are water-soluble, it doesn't need to be consumed as regularly, as they aren't stored for as long. The water-soluble ones, we need to consume them very regularly because we don't store them. Um, vitamin K is important for regulating thrombosis and platelet functioning. Good food sources include legumes or beans, leafy vegetables, and teas. For people who are on blood thinners, like Coumadin or heparin, it is important to have a low and relatively consistent intake of vitamin K. Iron, we just mentioned it, and in part, when I say here the food sources of iron, if you're needing to avoid iron, then these would be the foods that you'd want to um, be aware of, that, that, that there's iron here. Um, the minerals that are also important for building blocks for healthy bone marrow functioning, of course, iron is central to how we transport oxygen around the body. Heme iron is what gives red cells their characteristic color, and anemia is often detected because we notice a lack of the redness or pallor. Or pallor. Iron deficiency anemia is caused by insufficient or unavailable iron in the diet. Heme iron is found in the liver and um, red meat and is in the most bioavailable form that way. However, iron, like B vitamins, is also added to fortified breakfast cereals or enriched breads and crackers. Spinach became famous um, because of Popeye, but in fact the oxalates in the spinach don't make the iron as available. Um, and as I mentioned before about iron overload, we want to be cautious of that. Zinc is another mineral that is very important in healthy bone marrow functioning, in fact, in the functioning of all cells. In functioning of what? All cells, and um, especially in the bone marrow. It is a key regulator of DNA-forming structures called zinc fingers. Has anyone heard of a zinc finger here? Okay, now you will. <laughs> zinc fingers, if you think about the genome or the genetic code, which 
actually tells the cells what to do. They have punctuation, if you like, and these are these structures called zinc fingers. There was a book written a few years ago called Eat, Shoots, and Leaves. Anyone heard of that? If you take the commas out, that's somebody came and he ate, shot someone, and left, right? Or eats, shoots, things that grow out of the ground, and leaves. There's a, a vegan. Um, so punctuation makes a huge difference. And then when you think about replicating DNA, which essentially is so important for, I mean, there's nothing more important than the bone marrow. You want to be sure the correct punctuation is there. Otherwise, the cells don't get the right message. So that's why zinc is so important. Zinc and iron are both found in most protein-rich foods. Zinc deficiency is associated with an increased susceptibility to infections and loss of taste and smell. Zinc and iron are both important for healthy bone marrow functioning, but there are many more minerals, including magnesium and boron, which are found in vegetables, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And legumes, by the way, is another word for a bean, and essentially it's a plant when, when you look at it, it has a pod, and inside the pod are seeds. So, for example, soy um, is a legume, and um, it's, well, the reason they're different than a cereal is that the plant itself puts um, roots down into the ground, and there's a bacteria that comes on the root that actually helps to what they call fix nitrogen. So it actually has a little bit more protein in it than a cereal. And these are very important for farmers. I was actually brought up as a child on a farm. And you cr rotate crops, meaning that they would have two years of a cereal crop and then the year of a bean or a legume because that would actually add protein to the soil. So how can we be sure that we're getting these important nutrients in our diet? Here are some simple guidelines that may help. Choose fish at least three times a week. And why am I saying fish? Well, basically because it's rich in a very easily absorbed form of protein. I thought that that green tea salmon, I don't know if any of you had it, but it was melted in your mouth. It was just incredible. And, uh, you know, it's very tasty. And, of course, it not only has protein, but the oily fish, like sardines and salmon, have vitamin D in them. And vitamin D, we're beginning to recognize, has a lot of benefit for our overall health. So that's another reason to have the nice oily fish. Fruits, especially the dark pigmented types, and we have the berries, um, whether they're blueberries, blackberries, all sorts, they're especially beneficial because they have all of those three A's, which I talked about earlier, antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, and anti-carcinogens. So let your plate be colorful with vegetables at each main meal, and use lots of herbs and spices when you cook. Um, I was at a meeting, I was fortunate enough to make a presentation at the first international nutrition and cancer conference in Turkey, of all places, and they had a nice uh, buffet that for, for every meal we were there, and then just as you left the buffet, there were these big sacks full of turmeric and mixed herbs and mixed spices, and people would just come and take up, you know, a whole tablespoon and just pour it on their foods. They eat a lot of these really rich um, spices, and many of them not, not spicy spicy, but they're, you know, just adding flavor. Curry is a combination of different spices, by the way. Curry is sort of a generic word. I mean, you know, if you look at some curries may have up to 40 different ingredients, or some of them would maybe only have five or six. But most of them have cumin and turmeric, um, and, uh, which are all very rich in these three A's. So this is kind of what a typical healthy diet, might, daily menu might look like. And for many of you, you may say, gosh, that's an awful lot of food. Well, yes, it is, because it's not processed. I'm describing things that are more um, in their natural state. And when we eat simple whole foods, it is more satisfying, and you're less likely to overeat when you eat this way. Of course, there may be many reasons why you don't eat this way. So what I thought we'd do is we look at each in turn. Perhaps there are physical, bless you, perhaps there are physical reasons, such as a sore mouth, lack of appetite, irregular bowels, or maybe more subtle reasons, such as depression or fatigue. 
If you have a low white cell count, it is possible that you also have a sore mouth. And this may be a challenge to eating a broad range of foods. Here are some suggestions for how to choose foods that are easy to swallow and don't cause burning. So I'm not going to read all of these um, because it will be up on the website. And um, I don't know about you, I hate people who read slides. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> If your appetite is poor or you're feeling nauseated often, well, ginger is a great standby, and you can try it in various forms. Ginger comes as a ginger root, which you can make a soup with or, or steep it, and also ginger can be crystallized, so you could have just a little bit of a ginger, uh, crystallized gingers, or ginger tea, um, or even a ginger cookie, all these different things. Um, choosing when to, to eat is also important. I usually suggest not trying to eat too much at one time, but rather grazing through the day if you're feeling nauseated. And also, you know, there's no right or way, wrong way to eat. There's just culturally different ways. When I first came here, everybody said, you know, when I do a diet recall, somebody said, I ate dinner so late, it was at 7. Well, in England, people don't normally, if they're having a dinner, usually it's at 8. And if you're in Spain, it might be at 10 or 11 at night. So is that a right or wrong way? No, it's a cultural adaptation. So there's no right or wrong way. But in general, it isn't a good idea to go a very long time without having any calories. Um, and what I find is if many of the people that I see who are very fatigued, they may go to bed very early, maybe around 7 or 8, and actually possibly not have any calories at all until the same time the next day. Well, that's about 12 hours with no calories. And around 1 or 2 in the morning is when your body starts to do all the repair. And if there's no calories there, what's it going to do? It's going to rob your own muscle and take from there. So one of the suggestions I have is getting... Um, a relatively, you know, something that doesn't need to be refrigerated or you could put it into a thermos, something like papaya or apricot nectar or pineapple juice and just have it by the bed and have a couple of sips, then some water to rinse it out through the night. So if you wake up anyway, just have a couple of sips. And I found that that really helps um, with unwanted weight loss, which many people have. So what about bowel irregularity? Well, constipation is very common, especially if you have to take certain types of pain medications that slow down bowel transit. Natural remedies including more fiber, especially from pitted fruits such as plums, apricots, or cherries, have the added benefit of also being rich in those three A's. You should always avoid taking laxatives such as senna or cascara, though, because your body can become dependent on them. There's a great craze going on around Hollywood right now, with all sorts of in in intense juicing. Well, if you look at it, what it is, they've added cascara and senna to these things. So people are basically becoming dehydrated, and then they think that they're losing weight. <laughs> well, they're losing fluids. But... What about the opposite of constipation? This sometimes can occur and cause a lot of dehydration and even more fatigue as a result. Many people don't know that the first sign of, of um, dehydration is actually fatigue. So sometimes, you know, when you're feeling fatigue, you might not notice if you're dehydrated because you're already fatigued. So you want to make sure that you get foods that are the opposite for the constipation ones. Constipation is insoluble fiber. Here we're looking more at things with what we call soluble fiber. So, for example, the brat diet, but also applesauce, oatmeal, um, where they pull the water in and hold it there. So it will change the um, uh, texture of what's in your colon. And iceberg lettuce tends to give a lot of people diarrhea, so you want to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Depression, I think this may be the biggest barrier of all, because if you're depressed, then everything's an effort. Dark chocolate may be a good mood lifter, and again, I was brought up in England where a nice cup of tea, it's always said that way, you have a nice cup of tea, <laughs> it, it li literally solves all your problems. Now, usually that nice cup of tea is fairly strong Indian tea with a little bit of milk and a little bit of sugar, and actually is kind of what we call chai today. <laughs> so. 
Now, insomnia, I'm sure we, you've all felt this, and that's why I wanted to be sure you understood that when I, uh, the heading was incorrect because I didn't add the PNH. But um, insomnia can sometimes be aggravated if you have foods um, such as green tea or dark chocolate um, after, say, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, there are some people who are extremely sensitive to caffeine, and they really can't have very much caffeine ever at any time of the day. And then there are other people who can have, you know, toss back Red Bulls and don't even notice it. And that's to do with just different genetics. But for the majority of us, um, about two to three cups of tea or coffee a day is, is, is enough. And more than that, it's going to start to keep you awake at night. Another thing about insomnia, though, is it's really important to have a calm wind-down period at the end of the evening. You know, the worst thing to do is to watch the 11 o'clock news, which is, you know, usually full of horrible local crimes, and there's nothing you can do about it, and then you try and go to sleep on that. Um, so your room should be cool, dark, and quiet. And the reason it's so important is because, as I said earlier, it's between the hours of about 1 and 5 in the morning that your body is doing all its repair work. It's kind of like the computer defragments. Um, you, you know, the, the, the hard drive gets defragmented at night when you're not doing all the other work. It's the same thing with our bodies. All that DNA repair takes place. So if you're stressed or if you're still digesting a heavy meal or if you're just not getting... I mean, sometimes it's a s simple thing like your room's not dark enough or cool enough or you've got too many animals on the bed. I mean, it can be a lot of things. Um, or maybe a partner who snores. <laughs> I mean, all different things. But we need to get rid of the obvious things first. Um, <laughs> the fact that you are here today shows you're actively participating in your health. And this is so important, and I congratulate you all on taking this step and being here. You may also wish to keep records for yourself, and I know at lunch they were already saying this. Um, and I actually have a nutrition health checklist, which is available um, on, from my website. And if you send me an email, I make sure you get it at no charge. And I do really recommend keeping a record of your key information and some of it may be the things that your the doctor who's following you for the bone marrow disorders may not be the one who's testing you for these things but if you have your fasting glucose fasting cholesterol ldl and especially things like um your hemoglobin a1c you know these are all numbers that we it's a good idea to track them over time and keep them um Again, I'm talking about the three A's of DNA health. Antioxidants, protecting the DNA from the damage from free radicals. Anti-inflammatories, to prevent cells from dividing faster than normal and so making more mistakes. And anti-carcinogens, which prevent these mistakes from causing damage. So when we combine all this together, you may say, well, what should I eat? We know that good quality food is fresh or fresh frozen, prepared with natural ingredients from high-quality sources, including grass-fed animals that have been raised and killed humanely. And it's tasty. That's important. <laughs> um, colorful produce, herbs, and spices are usually signs that they are rich in the three A's. And if you add rosemary, thyme, oregano, all the culinary herbs, you boost the nutritional value of your foods immediately. So I recommend doing that often. And then there are also some foods that support the immune system in the sense that um, they stimulate natural killer cell production. And those are mushrooms of all sorts. Uh, we have, there's a whole lot of things called medicinal mushrooms, but actually all mushrooms are really good. And white button mushrooms, uh, there was a um, poster at the uh, cancer research meeting where somebody had taken like 50 different types of mushrooms from all over the world, and actually white button mushrooms were the most effective. So it, but you need quite a lot of them, so you, and, and they should be cooked. So now I'm going to just go into a little bit more detail about what those three A's are, and I just described to you before what they do. And antioxidants, first of all, they're the kind of the, the opposite of a pro-oxidant. So a pro-oxidant 
is something that would actually cause a free radical. And that happens naturally as we metabolize. It's not something that we're not making. So every time you have a fever, for example, we're actually creating more pro-oxidants, but we need to balance it with the antioxidants. So pro is for, anti is, is um, against. And that's why it's so important to have both. Make sure I don't get lost here. <laughs> Um, examples include the darkly pigmented foods, as I said before, nuts, avocados, red wine, and dark chocolate or cocoa. And here's some other examples. So, you know, you might find one or two of these foods that you really like. Well, then, you know, especially, for example, if you to take a flight to, across the pole to Europe or to Asia, you'd be exposed to natural radiation that is higher than the usual level. So then it would be a good idea to maybe have some blueberries covered in dark chocolate as a snack on the plane. There you go. <laughs> anti-inflammatory foods. Now, there's a lot of discussion of anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories are probably getting the same sort of amount of discussion as antioxidants used to get. And the reason for that is because inflammation, not the inflammation that you get if you scratch yourself and then immediately it gets hot and red, that's pulling all the white cells to the, to the area. But the type of inflammation that means, and some people are just born this way, that you have a little bit of chronic underlying inflammation that makes your cells divide faster than normal anyway as a, at a base level. Then if that's the case, those are people who do better. Some people say take a baby aspirin. Well, yeah, but how about having natural aspirin-like substances in the foods? So salicylate or salicylic acid is actually the name for aspirin. So here's other foods, turmeric, rosemary, thyme, apricots, broccoli. Some of these foods you're hearing over and over because they have diff there's different reasons for you to choose them. But anti-inflammatories are very important. Anti-carcinogens. Well, that means basically that if a mistake was made, and your body somehow didn't recognize it and continued to make that mistake and it was like the punctuation was wrong, the cell didn't understand it, then we need to have the mechanism for apoptosis is called programmed cell death. Basically, it means that the cells recognized it needs to, to disintegrate. So anticarcinogens are ways that it reminds the body that it needs to repair or destroy or recycle what's there. And again, same types of foods, the brownish spices and uh, Brazil nuts are an excellent source of selenium, but selenium can also be toxic. So I usually recommend people have mixed nuts because the mixed nuts means that you get one or two Brazil nuts, but not more. But you wouldn't want to have like a whole handful of Brazil nuts every day because that would be too much selenium. So what do we do to maintain health as well as possible? Really, health can be thought of as a balance between mental, physical, and spiritual health. And a lot of times in the healthcare system, we're always focusing on the physical, but we really need to look at the whole balance and make sure that um, whichever way you feel in that day that you're out of balance, maybe try to focus on that. And I urge you to seek help professional help whenever you can. And I love the idea of you having your uh, communities of hope because actually nobody understands what you're going through better than somebody who's dealing with a similar diagnosis. Of course, getting enough protein and being hydrated is also important. So there was a lot of promise at the beginning of this that I was going to talk to you about what not to do and what to avoid. And so I thought maybe we would focus on some of these. And herbs and botanicals may be thought of as traditional medicines in some cases. Now, the culinary herbs are different because they, are, they have active properties. They have the three A's, but they, they're not in small doses, so you'd have to only use them to treat a condition. But there are some things like St. John's wort or garlic, um, or grapefruits that are very helpful, but they use the same liver enzyme system as many of the medications, specifically the, many of the ones that are used with MDS. So basically what you can be doing is actually interfering with the activity of the medication. Now, to give you an example, this is not a medication for bone marrow condition, but 
many people may be on a cholesterol-lowering agent, a statin. So Lipitor also uses this same cytochrome P450. It's called the 3,4A, and it's very, very, um, a lot of different medications use this same pathway to become inactivated. So if you then have grapefruit or lime or bitter orange in large quantities, I'm not talking about a little bit, you would actually be potentially either not activating the medication, or in the case of the statin, the um, level can become harmful. So if you want to take these things, you need to always check with your doctor, and I would recommend checking with a pharmacist as well. And the other thing to bear in mind is that there is a new field called pharmacogenomics, which actually looks at the fact some people have variations in the gene expression of these different enzymes. So for some people, um, well, let me put it differently. The PDR is the physician death reference, which is how a doctor makes a decision about a dosage. And that's based on a normal distribution of individuals having this response. But you may not be that. You may be somebody who has we were talking earlier about bone marrow transplant and HLA, you may be somebody who has a very different expression of these enzymes, and may, you may need very little ginkgo, say, to have a huge effect. So until we know more about that, I just think it's being, we should be very cautious in what you take when you take medicinal herbs or botanicals, um, as well as any medication. It's fine if you are under the treatment of somebody who's a pharmacist, and the ph but you need to tell the pharmacist is what I'm saying, just so long as everybody has it written down. Another reason to keep good records. Okay. Now I think what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is sugar, because that's another word that um, I hear a lot about. And people say, oh, you know, is, is sugar the cause of everything that's going wrong in my body? And, um, or should I avoid sugar completely? And this, I've actually got a YouTube video which you can look at called Nutrition and Cancer, Myths, Controversies, and Realities. And somebody commented under the, the talk about the fact that I hadn't addressed sugar in, and what a bad thing it was and that Nobel Prize winners must can't have been wrong. And so I did a lot of research and on the word sugar and how some people, you know, combine a lot of different things together for sugar. And um, if you're interested in, he's, he's quite passionate about the topic and we have a long discussion under there. But the word sugar is everything from table sugar, which is one molecule of fructose and one molecule of glucose, to... Um, you know, uh, sugar as a general term. And the main thing for fatigue is that you get a consistent amount of glucose, which is the main uh, way that the brain uses fuel, that you get it consistently in your diet. And rather than having a roller coaster of glucose that's going up and down and up and down, we want to have a more consistent flat flashish line. Now, I mentioned earlier about A1C. A1C is actually a measure of how consistently your body has been handling glucose over time. And pre-diabetes are people who basically have, for whatever reason, maybe genetics, maybe diet, um, their uh, blood sugar levels consistently are higher than ideal. So glycemic, gly means sugar, in a general way, and emic means blood, of course. So what we want to do is have something that has a relatively low glycemic load. And the way you do that is by adding more fiber. So that's having more plant foods in your diet and more plant foods that have not been refined. And this is essentially saying the same thing. And another reason for the fiber is not just for the blood sugar, but also for the fact that it provides a nice home for all the probiotics, which are the opposite of antibiotics. These are the microbes. There's about 10 times as many microbial cells in and on us as our own human cells, which is an amazing thought. So we need to make sure that they thrive. Um, and just having a yogurt with a probiotic in it for two or three weeks is not going to do it if you don't have the fiber there, because those probiotics are not going to thrive. They need, they need a nice home. Otherwise, they're homeless. 
Um, okay, another important aspect, um, or another question I get a lot is organic. Should I buy organic? What is organic? And of course, pesticides can be quite harmful to the bone marrow. So we know that that's important to, um, to query that. Now, this is not something that's always going to be the same, but this environmental working group, ewc.org, it's a not-for-profit organization, and they do list what they call the dirty dozen. And the dirty dozen are basically the 12 foods that you, it's worth spending money buying organic. Um, and they have a little uh, shopping list that you can print and take with you when you go shopping. And this changes. Uh, but these are the current ones. And that I do think, you know, we don't need to buy everything organic, but certainly there are some things that it is worth it. Do you have that? Okay, so putting it all together, what, what are we really saying here? One of the things I think we should be very careful about are supplements. And it's not that I'm against supplements. It's just that we don't know where many of these ingredients come from. I happened to talk to a man at a trade show who's responsible for the uh, selling the largest amount of supplements to Walgreens, CVS, Costco. And he himself was saying that 90 to 95 percent of the ingredients, the raw ingredients, are coming from China and Asia. And if, if any of you have been to China, the air quality and water quality is not what it is here in California. So it, it just makes you question why would you take something where you don't know where it was grown, and they say, well, we quarantine the ingredients. Yeah, but they're quarantining them for um, infectious, uh, known infections. They're not actually quarantining them for um, potentially hazardous uh, possible, um, my, I'm not saying toxins, but things that may be harmful. So it's really a matter of choice, but, but weigh it. I saw a gentleman about a week ago, who was taking 30 separate single nutrients as supplements. I have no idea what he was spending on it, but it was like, why? And when you've got good food here, we have farmer's markets, we have wonderful food, why do you need to do that? You really don't. Well, that's my feeling anyway. Um, but just be cautious about it, and if you are taking things, make sure you write it all down and even if you think your doctor doesn't know about supplements or doesn't think, think about it, at least you've got it written down. These are the things to have documented, not just your blood results, but also what you're taking. Okay, so this, this I showed you before, but basically it's a summary, you know, what I feel is important. Foods that are rich in these three A's, but fish, or at least if you're not having fish, um, having maybe an algae source of the omega-3, or hopefully if you chia and flax, if you feel good on those. And you know because if you don't feel good when you're taking only those things, you may uh, need the additional omega-3s. And I think it's really important to think of food as sustenance. It isn't a dietary restriction. You know, we're not food accountants. We're not just sitting there talking about the numbers. When you think about food, you're thinking about pleasure. You're thinking about taste. You're thinking about social connections. It's, it's what we do, we've done every day of our lives is feed in some way. Um, it's not something that we need to constantly be restricting. Unfortunately, you know, so much... Is, is about this diet or that diet. And a long time after I started in this field, somebody said to me, why would you ever want a diet? It's got the word die in it. <laughs> it took me years to think that, but he's right. <laughs> so this is my favorite quote. This is from Albert Einstein. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. And at that same meeting I went to in Turkey, I had just heard this quote, and I got to the meeting, and I was very scared because it's like the very far east of Turkey, and I went by myself, um, and I had just heard this quote. And I got into the hotel room, and I looked out the window, and the next door hotel was called The Miracle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is all right. <laughs> 
And it was. It was a wonderful meeting. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we do have some time for questions. And um, even if we don't, I will stay for a little while afterwards so you get a chance to ask questions. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, oh, sorry. She's. <laughs> Is it on? I'll answer the question. I, th I think I think I got what you were saying. Yeah, I mean, the, the anything that's fresh and hasn't been damaged. Um, when I say not being damaged, you know, once you crush. If you got if you got your own herbs and you crush them with your fingers, you release the volatile oils that have a lot of the the, the flavor and, and the aroma, and these volatile oils are actually very very beneficial. So when you get the dried herbs, they really don't have those anymore because most of them are being crushed. But you are still getting some of the benefits. But you do, it, it's a little different. Sometimes with the the fresh herbs, you may use more. But also, it's got to do with what you're, co what you're cooking. Oh, nice segue. <laughs> I have two books. <laughs> these are re they're different recipes. This one is called the Everything Cancer Fighting Cookbook. So basically, these are just healthy recipes. And they're not my recipes, but I supervised it. And this is a book that I originally started giving people as handouts. And then I, I just keep updating it. And this is actually in its fourth edition. Um, and these are all my own recipes. And there's about 120 recipes here. And about 30 of them are smoothie recipes. So if you want to add those extra protein servings, this is an easy way to do it. And you're certainly welcome to take a look at them afterwards. They're both available in electronic format. And you can buy them at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever. And um, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Um, what about food allergies, people that are allergic to the majority of the food that you mentioned up there? I am one of those people, but I don't have MDS. My mother does. Um, and I think she has some of the same food allergies, but she refuses to get tested. OK, that's a great question. It's about food allergies. Well, there's a little bit of a difference between food sensitivities and food allergies. True food allergies are the ones that people have to shellfish, say, you know, when they're suddenly their throat closes up and they can't breathe. That's a real food allergy. But many people have food sensitivities, meaning that their immune system responds to the antigens in the foods. And there's a little bit of controversy about that because some people feel that if you're sensitive to certain foods, you do better by having a small amount every three days, say, in what's called a rotation diet, because then your body becomes a little bit adapted to it. Whereas if you completely eliminate them, sometimes you get more of an overreaction when you are exposed to them. But that's not, not everybody thinks that that's the way to go, but some people do. Did I do something? <laughs> um, so uh, the answer is that... Um, some of the sensitivities and allergies that we're becoming much more aware of, and the one that I think is important to know about is celiac disease. There is, um, I believe, a study that was recently published. It is an unusual connection, but somebody who had a plastic anemia and celiac disease. Um, celiac is a, is a sensitivity to gluten, which is in many of the grains. And what's happened is the wheat genome, which is actually very, very complex, um, has recently been mapped. And that means that there's an opportunity to take some of those allergens out, and which is exactly what you're seeing when you see all these gluten-free products that are out there. That's basically because they've been able to tweak it and remove some of the allergens from it. One of the things that I would recommend is actually using a digestive enzyme. There are digestive enzymes that are specific um, for enteric-coated you know, enzymes that will actually help you because most of those allergens are proteins that once they're broken down into their amino acids or peptides, they're not as allergenic in, in the bloodstream. And unfortunately, the tests for these things are quite... They're not as accurate as we'd like. There's a lot of people out there testing for food allergies that are 
uh, questionable, <laughs> let me put it that way. But um, even with celiac disease, unless you've biopsied the in, intestinal tissue, you, you still may not be getting, you may be getting false positives. So don't avoid them. Sorry? So don't avoid them. Um, I wouldn't say don't avoid them. I, if there are things that are not, uh, that are causing you discomfort, um, I think, I think I would add the digestive enzymes, number one, and number two, I would rotate them, meaning having the offending food one day, wait two days, and then have it again. And most likely what I would do is, is consult an expert, you know, a, a, a health professional who's either an allergist or a dietitian or a nutritionist who's used to working in this field. But also be aware, talking about scams, there's so much scams about food, food allergies, it's unreal. L look on those websites, it'll tell you what's up. What Yes. A question. Hydrocolic acid with digesting meats, is that yes. helpful or not? And then secondly, any is all this food, uh, blood type, you know, food around blood type, that's all garbage? <laughs> um, okay, let me take the first one first. Hydrochloric acid is essentially um, what your stomach secretes in the presence, well, at all times, your stomach has a low pH, meaning it's acidic. Um, if you think about historically, when we've eaten meat, the meat wasn't necessarily very clean. Um, and so the acid in your stomach acts like a bit of an antiseptic. And it's important in terms of helping to digest the meat in the beginning, but it also acts as sort of an antiseptic to prevent some of the infections. And it's interesting when somebody has H. pylori, which is an infection, it's because they're, it may have been, because it's, it's too strong a word, but it's associated with inappropriate acid secretion, meaning their acid secretion is not sufficient. So the digestive enzymes, if they're not enteric coated, they'll be digested in the stomach and they won't be doing their job. So they, you need to get them in a certain format so they're going to the small intestine, which is where we really need them to do their job. And good quality enteric coated digestive enzymes will pass through that hydrochloric acid barrier, if you like. The second part of your question about blood type, um, you know, I've I think that the author of that book or that whole money-making business he has um, is on to something, but like many people who are not real scientists, it's really hard to understand what he's getting at. Um, but there are antigens or foreign molecules that, that tell your body they're not self, a self and not self. Um, his argument is that those who've evolved um, from type O, type A, type B should be eating different foods based on that. But, you know, he's using in vitro data for that. And arguably, what I just said to that other lady, you know, your body is adapted to being faced with not self all the time. Um, and just to avoid things isn't necessarily the way to go. But I, I you actually bring up an interesting point about it because since we now know so much more about HLA typing and so much more about antigens, I don't know how his concept has evolved or if, or if it has. But he's not a scientist who's in the mainstream, let me put it that way. But he could be onto something. You know, sometimes people don't have to be in the mainstream to be onto something. <laughs> yeah. What do you think of goji berry in relation to a patient with an MDS or overall? Is goji berry good for you? Well, I don't actually, I didn't show you that slide today, but I have a slide on antioxidant ORAC, which is a way you quantify the amount of antioxidants. And when that first was evolved in, I don't remember, about 15 years ago by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, it's a color change test where you can quantify how much antioxidant activity a fruit or a vegetable extract has. And that's where they saw that blueberries were very high. So then, of course, everyone went around the world and said, well, what else is high? And that's when goji and acai were first found to be, have a very high ORAC score, meaning that they're very, very strong antioxidants. Since your natural cycle of metabolism includes pro-oxidants and antioxidants. My only concern when you have very, very high antioxidants 
you may actually be inhibiting some natural processes, such as the recycling of cells, and apoptosis, all of this, which requires, uh, um, let me put it differently. I, I think sometimes you can overdo antioxidants, and goji berries have a very high antioxidant reading. But, you know, they are usually have, for people who are in al at altitude or somewhere where they've actually, they want to have um, that support. As far as MDS is concerned, I really wouldn't know. Um, I don't know if anyone's done any studies on that, but goji berries are traditional uh, fruit, really. I'm not, not a medicine, they're a fruit. Any other questions? Yes, hi, Ms. Katzen. Um, from watching your presentation, a lot of really good sound generalized healthy nutrition practices. I was wondering your position or ideas on a neutropenic diet for those people who have uh, very low white blood cell counts. Because yeah. th things that normally seem healthy aren't healthy at that time. Right. A neutropenic diet is also something that's kind of evolved. You know, we used to say that if you, your white cell count was below a certain number, arbitrarily, um, then you had to have everything cooked and everything, you know, had to be extremely um, protected from any uh, microbes. Mm -hmm. With the understanding of the whole microbiome, which is actually that, what I said to you about the, the microbes that live in and on us, um, I think there's a different thought about that. I think it's more to do with making sure that you don't have harmful microbes, but not necessarily that you don't have microbes, because we all have microbes. We're, how are we supporting them? And if you've ever made yogurt, you know that it's you know, a, an evolution from when one colony comes and then another one comes and then another one comes. So I think that this is a, a field where since we're learning so much about the microbiome, we're, really, we're not being as arbitrary about it. That, that's my personal feeling. Thank you. And this is kind of a three-part question. You're leading off of that. You know, the smoothie concept and, and stuff, we do a lot of that. Concerns, questions, or limitations on selection of types of proteins or proteins and green supplements along that line? Yeah, I mean, protein, the sources of proteins that are used for most protein drinks are um, either soy or whey or um, eggs and in the majority of cases, they have been hydrolyzed or broken down into uh, peptides, which are very well absorbed, and amino acids, which are also well absorbed, but not as well absorbed as peptides. And at a certain point, it it's, it's almost doesn't matter what the protein was in the beginning because they're so, um, they're so, high, so, so made available to the body. Um, this is an area where bodybuilders get very, you know, enthusiastic about their source of protein or somebody else gets very enthusiastic about this or it has to be in its, its state that's not being denatured. Um, I, you know, I, I guess, I mean, I, I, I need to know a little bit more about what, could, could you? Uh, in, the, in the context of a uh, aplastic anemia patient, for instance. Yeah, I mean, are you asking which protein I would, would think was better? That, yes. Um, I would probably say whey. I think that whey protein is, um, uh, uh, has, it, the whole evolution of whey being used was, was initially used for HIV positive patients who were looking to support their immune function. And that's why I think that whey is um, a very good source of something called um, glutathione. And glutathione is essentially very important for liver and kidney function and general function. So yeah, I would probably say whey if I was going with anything. Does that answer your question? No? Yeah, the third part? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does. I appreciate it. And just the final question I had is right after I walked in, you mentioned uh, Kangen as an example. Yes. And seeing those around all over the place, it's wondering your thoughts on that? Well, and again, this is a long, you know, it's, it's a question that, that's kind of complicated. Kangen is an example of a water that is sold where you're modifying the pH um, theoretically of your, uh, your blood. And um, 
If you go to my YouTube video, I actually have a couple of slides there where I address that very specifically. And I have a, what I think is 70-30 balance of, of, of foods that are more alkaline, more acidic. Um, do I think you need to spend the money on the water? Probably not. But, you know, I, I don't want to say yes, no. But the main thing about pH is it's regulated by breathing more than anything else. So when you exercise, or you, if you can't exercise because you're fatigued, if you do deep breathing, you're actually normalizing your pH better than anything else. So that's, you know, your lungs are actually where the, the, the exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide, that is where you buffer and where you actually keep your pH in balance. So drinking, uh, you know, water, I've also heard some sort of horror stories of people who have too much alkaline water, and then, you know, women can get uh, vaginal infections. Um, you know, we have an acid mantle on our body. Our skin and our mouths are slightly acidic, almost the same reason as the stomach. You know, usually bacteria don't like that very much, or the harmful ones don't. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't want to sound terribly negative about it because I, I, I'm sure there are some qualities, but the main thing is the importance of breathing and deep breathing. It's really important for, and obviously drinking water, yes. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Any other questions? I don't know if we have someone else coming in the room, so well, I... Well, we have, we have the support groups after, so yeah. thank you, Ms. Katz. Okay, thank no, you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.